Din Tai Fung, often considered the best Chinese restaurant chain in the entire world, is also very controversial amongst Chinese Americans. We're going to talk about why and what maybe the underlying issue is because it goes much deeper than soup dumplings. Oh, man, the things that divide a community, man. First off, Andrew, RIP to Bing Yi Yang, uh, passed away at 96 years old. He is the founder, along with his wife, of the Din Tai Fung Empire. Andrew, uh, they're very famous globally for being the most famous Shaolong Bao soup dumpling chain in the world. Uh, he was from northern China. He left during the war, went to Taiwan, had an oil company, started selling soup dumplings, uh, you know, infused some Japanese techniques to get the paper-thin skin and make sure every single one was consistent. I mean... And then the rest is history. Yeah, guys, we're going to talk about it. Uh, why Why is this so heavily debated? And often it becomes a little bit of an emotional, possibly political and ideological issue. So yeah. please hit that like button and check out other episodes of the Hot Pop Boys, David. Let's take it out from the micro mid to the macro. Here. Yeah, I'm not going to lie, Andrew. The micro is always shocking because even on the RIP Bing Yi Yang post, Andrew, some people could just not resist and be like, well, I think the Din Tai Fung is overrated and overpriced. <laughs> so this is a huge debate. If you're going to say that on somebody's RIP post, like clearly... You just really strongly feel that way. It's the internet. But yeah, David, let's just tack you the, tackle this real quick. Is Din Tai Fung in 2023 overrated? No, but. No, but. I will say this. The Taipei 101 version is 10 out of 10. The rest in Asia are 9 out of 10. I think once it came into America, it slipped to 8.5 out of 10. And some of the locations are like down at 8 out of 10 now. So you're, so you're looking at a 20% discount off the peaks already just because they just can't make them as good in so, America. So you're saying it might be causing con some confusion because some people are going to the Glendale location or they're going to this new New York location and they're like, it wasn't as good as I remember. Or this is not worth the money because they are kind of pricey. So... But then, obviously, whenever you come back from Taiwan, everybody's like, oh, my gosh, Din Tai Fung was so good. It was the best. Yeah, I'm not going to lie, Andrew. The one near our hometown in South Center uh, by the airport in Seattle is like a 7 out of 10. That's yeah. the worst Din Tai Fung I've ever been to. Here's my opinion. After having eaten a lot of Shaolong Bao uh, from Shanghai to uh, America to, to Taiwan and Southeast Asia even, it's like... Uh, I just think Din Tai Fung is still the gold standard. I'm not saying it is 100% always the best and better than everything else, especially per dollar, but it's the gold standard, and everybody compares their soup dumplings to them, so I don't know. Tell me another gold standard. Right. Show me another one. Yeah, I'm not saying there's not mom and pop shops here and there that, like, don't give you a better value for your dollar, yeah. but as far as a multinational chain, no way. I mean, honestly, that's my honest opinion, not sponsored. I'll say this, Andrew. What are the two camps of people who are inherently anti Din Tai Fung in the Chinese-American community? One of them... And shout out to, we're part Shanghainese, is Shanghainese people. Oh, yeah. Well, that want to claim uh, the Shaolong Bao, obviously. But well, they don't want a Taiwanese chain to make the best Shaolong Bao when it, originally Shanghai is taking credit right, for it. Right, just like anybody from Philadelphia doesn't want to admit that there's a better Philly cheesesteak outside of Philly, possibly. Right. Like, which is very, very possible, by right. the way. Right, that is uh, totally human nature. I will say this, though, Andrew. The Shaolong Bao actually is originally from Nanshang, Jiangsu. Or some Ooh. people even argue Wuxi. Wuxi and, uh, you know, Nanshang, they're close to Shanghai. But you know how it is, Andrew, in that region. Shanghai is like the big dog water town. It's going to pretty much take credit for everything around that zone. Right, So right, that's right. the nativist angle, right? I okay. guess for me and my perspective, that's just pretty logical. You're not going to change those people's minds, right? However, Andrew, there is another crowd that thinks that Din Tai Fung is white people soup dumplings. Right, and I think these are a lot of Chinese Americans. And a lot of people who associate the fact of Din Tai Fung's popularity and the fact that you can go to Din Tai Fung's and there are like all types of people eating, non-Chinese people right. eating there. And they're very clean. Yeah. They're very fancy. The build-outs are expensive. And very expensive. Yes, it's not cheap to eat at Din Tai Fung. So then they associate that with, oh, this is white people Chinese food now. Oh, it's for white people. But I'm like, whoa, 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 guys, guys, let's just be clear. The first locations at Din Tai Fung were all in Asia. Taiwan and Shinjuku. Yeah, Shinjuku, Tokyo. So what? Is it because it's less greasy and it's cleaner? Was that to cater to white people? Or was that to cater to Japanese? Or was it because Bing Yi Yang actually really admired the Japanese like mannerisms? Right. Yes, guys, in this video, I'm trying to tell you, it's not the white people's fault here. <laughs> yeah. It might be the Japanese. The Jap yeah, because obviously Japanese tastes, they're 
uh, the way they look at food and art, they obsess about it. It's right. typically, right, they obsess about it. The very uh, such attention to detail, professionalism, cleanliness, right? That's kind of the Japanese way as right, we know Right, right. And I'm not saying there's nobody in China doing that, especially, of course, the imperial chefs like that and stuff like that. But on a general basis, people are probably more like chabuduo or right. tamdo, which so, means like, you know, close enough. So, David, if... Let, and let's take it out to the macro now. If... Din Tai Fung is super clean and super systemized. Like they're putting 18 pleats in each little Shao Bao. We were in the back of the kitchen before. I went, I, I cooked Shao Long Bao in the back of the Taipei 101 yeah, location. It okay? is a very robotic, yeah. systemized. And very they weigh clean. everything out. Yeah, they weigh everything. And, and it's so exact, so precise. I guess like, why won't more people admit that it's like the gold standard Shao Bao? Or what is it about this that gets people so emotional? Like so I many think, Chinese American foodies that are like, no, 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 no. Even like somebody like Freddie Wong, nice guy, but I don't agree with his Chinese food takes, right? He says, no, he Tai does Fung, not know more than we do. That's I not a good it. Chinese restaurant or that's overdone. Like it's not worth it. I'm like, yeah. nah. Yeah, listen, guys. I mean, to me, it just is like a nostalgia for like the folksy sort of villagey way of running things. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying there's not some great products out of the villages. I've been to Chinese villages myself. I've been to places run by people from the villages. There's a very certain charm to it. Oftentimes the surface is more uh, service is more personable, mm -hmm. and of course it's much much cheaper. But we cannot think that that can be the only representation of Chinese food that Chinese people want to eat. Right, and you're saying that because Chinese food was not only solely for like blue collar people. First of all, there's great dishes that come from everywhere. I, yeah, I, I think I, we did a hell of a job blue collarizing it or blue collarizing uh, dishes that were always staple dishes or even blue collarizing imperial dishes for the American market. Right. But that doesn't mean that it's meant to stay that way forever. And I do think that mindset within the Chinese American community is slowing some of the progress Right, like obviously, oh. like Japanese, they don't care. They'll charge like six hundred dollars per person for dinner, but they feel like they're so confident in providing that amount of value for six hundred. David, right? are you trying to say that possibly sometimes the Chinese pragmatism, the extreme Chinese pragmatism, perhaps overly pragmatic, if you will, can prevent Chinese people or Chinese culture or cuisine from moving to where it could be? Yes, that ah. is one hundred percent. True. And I don't know where people, you know, I get it. I think the pragmatism is very logical, looking at where things were with the poverty and the austerity. And I think people spend a lot of time with their grandparents and their parents, and they learn that pragmatism. But that pragmatism really is a huge impediment to moving the cuisine forward to things like Hao Noodle, to things like Dolar Shop, Da Long Yi, you know, uh, Din Tai Fung, Team Ho Wan. I'm not saying all of these are 10 out of 10 home runs. But you got to keep trying. Mm, Not yeah. everything's going to stay the little mom and pop forever. Those are great. And those yeah. serve a different demographic. But that demographic can't be like, oh, I'm getting these Shalom Bows half off. And they're 80% as good. And then hate on yeah, this one. Listen, no, no, no. And if you say you don't want to go to Sh Din Tai Fung because it's overpriced, I totally understand that. I don't go to Din Tai Fung all the time partially because it's just... It's just very pricey, right? Right. So I g get it. I am price sensitive. Everybody, like, you know we are. We do Chinatown cheap eats. We love Chinatown cheap eats. There's a place for it. There's always a place for it, but there's always a place for another level up. And I think what happens is sometimes people see, like, a pricier, high-quality Chinese restaurant opening. It doesn't have to be Din Tai Fung. It could be any high-end hot pot chain, Da Long Yi, anything from China or whatever. And we're not talking Asia. about those, like, fusion spots, yeah. like, a, you know what I mean, like a Mr. Chow's or something. Yeah, yeah, I'm not talking, yeah. I'm not talking about that, but I guess every time somebody kind of sees that open, some people are like, oh, they're trying to replace my narrative, the narrative that I'm part of, and that... Chinese food is just can be very cheap and it's the best deal and it's extremely right. tasty. It's folksy. It's and you don't color. have to care about the menus. You don't have to care about like you can they, they can be a little bit sticky and the service isn't good. And that's how it should be. And I'm like, that's how some of it should be. To keep it yeah. cheap, it has to be like yeah. that. And especially for people, they should run businesses, you know, to survive and, yeah. and feed their family. 100%. But it doesn't mean that that's who we all are. Or what we have to be, or that's the limit of what we can sell our cuisine to 
to other people at. Right. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. Just looking at the design of a Shaolong Bao, David, the fact that there's the gelatin that melts to make the soup and then you have to fold it all together and, and very delicately steam it. I feel like that's that must have come from yeah. like the middle class. And anyways. listen, man, you got to understand the dispossession of a narrative. Like that's the same thing that a lot of people are going through in America right now, mm. right? Certain things that felt like they oh. were for them or they fit the bulk distri distribution of a group. But all of a sudden this whole framework is changing on them. It makes people feel very uncomfortable, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it obviously this is something very trivial, right? We're talking about the niceness of a Shaolong Bao spot. Okay, guys, we're literally talking about dumplings here, but it is also... Kind of an analogy for what is happening around tribalism. Listen, a lot of people in America, and this is taking a super, super macro, but a lot of people in America feel like their country is changing before their eyes. Well, right? I can't turn on the TV and see Johnny Cash anymore. I got to see people with Dracos with an extendo clips. I don't know. Well, all these purple hair, all these different identities, man. I'm not ready for it. That's not how I see the world. And then you got coffee shops serving lattes for $7. I mean, you know, I growing can't even up, pronounce it. I didn't even have lattes. We just drank black coffee for $2. What's going on here? And I do empathize. Yeah. I empathize with anybody who feels like their narrative is shifting on them. I mean, I'll give them this and I'll end it on this on my part. I, I, Life was simpler back then. For sure. Life got more complicated. It's a more nuanced world. Uh, I admit it. I even grew up in the nuanced world. So I, I can feel your pain. But anyways, taking it out back to Chinese food. Um, you know, I just don't think, as people who love Chinatown cheap eats, I don't think that Chinese food always has to be cheap. And I don't think that those expensive Chinese food is always overrated. And it's not always overpriced. Sometimes you want a high-end experience. You want to be served politely and precisely by a Chinese person or somebody who works at a Chinese restaurant and you want that experience and you want to know that your culture can reach this level. It's great to know that it's also at this level, but it's yeah. good to know it's at this level. Hey guys, there's room for everybody at every level. All right, everybody, uh, we're going to wrap it up right there. Let us know what you think about this whole thing. Obviously, if you're a, a foodie yourself, like, do you think Tin Tai Fung is very overrated? And why? And what does it mean? Like, where do you want to see Chinese food in the future? Is it a free-for-all? Everybody can just fuse it, do whatever, make it expensive, and do it at your own risk, yeah. right? And do you think that Asian Americans or Chinese Americans, we kind of get attached to this, like, certain way we grew up, and then... Once it starts changing on us, do we feel uncomfortable with it? Or should we just change with it? Let us know in the comment section below. I don't think there's a wrong answer. Keep it civil until next time. We the Hot Pot Boys. We out. Peace. Peace.